Hi, I'm Penny Crimes, and I'm here to tell you about my book, my magical adventure book, The Dragon and Her Boy. Now, The Dragon and Her Boy is actually the sequel, the second in a series of books about a gang of street kids called Gutterlings in Victorian London. And this is the first book, this is called Tigerheart. And Tigerheart tells the story of a chimney sweep called Fly, chimney sweep's hat, who falls into a tiger's cage, tiger. And she has to rescue, find a way of rescuing the tiger and returning him to his homeland, despite the dark and dangerous forces ranged against them. And she and the gang of gutlings have a lot of fun on the way. Now, in the second book, the hero is Stick, who's Fly's best friend. And he's, uh, he works as a street acrobat or a tumbler. Now the story starts when Stick's best friends, Spud and Sparrow, who are also tumblers, disappear one very hot day in August when they're doing tricks for <coughs> people at Bartholomew Fair. Now Stick is the great thinker amongst the gusslings. He's famed for his, the best wheezes and he always comes up with them when chewing on his pipe. Although he never has any tobacco in it. So Stick discovers a gap leading underground and he decides, something tells him, that the secret to what's happened to Spud and Sparrow lies beneath the earth. In a moment, I'm going to read to you from the moment when Stick first meets his dragon. But first, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Guttling's world. Now, all the Guttlings are orphans. None of them have got any parents. And they all live on the streets. They don't have any homes. So the only way that they can get any money to eat, to eat or to somewhere to sleep at night is to work. So they've all got jobs. And that was true of lots of children in Victorian London. So Fly, who's a chimney sweep, who I already told you about, <coughs> chimney sweeps used to push small children up and down the chimneys and to scrub out the soot so that the chimneys didn't catch fire. And that must have been a horrible job, being shoved up and down those chimneys. A couple of the gutlings, Bandy and Squinty, are crossing sweepers. And they used to have to spend all day brushing up mud and dust in the roads so that the toffs, the posh people, didn't get their nice clean trousers dirty. And Tree and Sess, who are sisters, work as mudlocks, digging around in the freezing mud of the River Thames in the hope of finding a few coins or bits of metal or anything that they could sell so that they could buy some food. None of the gutlings do this job. Guess what this is? Sewer hunter. Hmm. Yeah. Don't think we have to talk about that too much. Hunter. Mm. Yeah, don't think we have to talk about that too much. The other thing you'll find in my books is that my gossings have lots of slang, lots of words that you might not be familiar with. And I got them, a lot of them out of this book, which is a huge book of slang, which tells me how the gutlings talked at the time. And they also, and I also, found uh, some lots of words in this. Where's Victorian Dictionary of Slang and Phrase? Here's one of my favourites. Dying duck in a thunderstorm. Oh, here's my cat come to join in. Hello. A dying duck in a... She's got her face like a dying duck in a thunderstorm. The image was pretty miserable. Or bags of mystery. That's what they call sausages, because nobody knew what was in them. So before I read to you from the dragon and her boy, goodbye, Betsy. Off you go. I thought we might like to do a little quiz. What do you think these words might mean? Adelpated, buffle-headed, cunning as a dead pig, daffy and dunderhead. Well, perhaps you'd like to save some of those up and have them as the best insults you can try out on your friends. They're all words for somebody who hasn't all got all these buttons on. He's not very bright. What about these words? Humbug, gammon and spinach, rubbish and codswallop. Well, those are all words you can use if people, you think people are talking nonsense. 
and you don't believe a word that they're saying. Now, here's the third one. The alicolly, colly molly and mopey as a wet hen. Oh, here comes Betsy again. These are all ways of saying someone is miserable and they've got a face like a dying duck in a thunderstorm. And this is the last one. Finally, kicked the bucket, snuffed it, hopped the twig and brown bread. And the clue is in what you call rhyming slang in the last one. If someone's brown bread, they're dead. Anyway, I had lots of fun with those words. And when you read the book, I'm sure you'll guess what they all mean. And if you don't, excuse me, Betsy, there's a little, at the back, there's something called Sticks Guide to Gustling, which tells you what all those words mean. It'll give you a fine repertoire of insults to use on your friends, but not on your teachers or your mum and dad. Now, I'm going to read to you and Betsy from the bit where Stick, the tumbler, first meets the dragon. Being a tumbler by trade, Stick had landed light and soundless as a feather on his feet, but he sensed that something had heard him and that that something was waiting for his next move. His eyes were starting to adjust to the low light, but he couldn't tell whether it was something very large that was trying to appear very small or something very small that was trying to appear very large. He couldn't hear anything breathing now. He reckoned it was holding its breath, just like he was holding his. One of us is going to have to take a breath in a moment, Stick thought, or we'll both end up brown bread. Gadzooks! Who dares to wake me? Stick jumped like a jelly deal. Even to a lad who liked to deal in, in facts, the sound could only have been described as a roar. Not a loud roar, but loud enough to be uncomfortable and hot enough to be uncomfortable too. Something long and snake-like whipped out at him from the shadows and slithered over his skin, leaving a trail of slime behind it. It felt horribly like a large tongue, almost like it was tasting me. Stick shivered. And then the snaky thing disappeared and there was a noise that sounded rather like someone smacking a pair of large lips. Stick backed away, but he didn't get very far before he hit that wall again. There was nowhere to go. He kept quiet and tried to do what he did best, think. The roar had put him in mind of Ty Fly's tiger. But he pushed that thought away because meeting a tiger what didn't try to eat you, but even let you ride on, ride on its back, that was something that only happened to people like Fly, not to a lad who dealt in facts like himself. He'd had a, super, a suspicion back then that Fly could talk to her tiger, but he'd always tried to ignore that because it wasn't possible. Besides, when her tiger roared, it didn't feel so hot that it hurt. No. This definitely wasn't a tiger, it was something else entirely. But he wasn't ready to hold a conversation with whatever it was just yet. It might, after all, not be real. A figment of what he'd heard people call imagination. Stick tried alternately squinting and then opening his eyes very wide, but he still couldn't make anything out in the shadows. He sniffed. There was a strong smell now of burnt dust and rotten eggs. The devil are you? He hadn't meant to say it out loud, but it somehow slipped out. Devil! There was a long snort, so hot that Stick could feel it singeing the fraying edges of his kex. The voice of whatever it was went on. I hope you are not fool enough to hold with that superstitious nonsense. I assure you that I have been down here a very long time, boy, and I have never had the least whiff of Beelzebub. Stick slapped at what was left of his smouldering trousers and took a deep breath. It ain't real, he told himself quietly. It's just a bit of sausage what's disagreed with you and set up a rumpus in your chitterlings. Sausage! A long, scaly, dusty snout of an indeterminate colour was suddenly thrust into his thin chest, knocking him back against the wall. Did you say sausage? There was a loud, eager sniff. <laughs> A sniff that almost inhaled Stick's remaining rags from his back. 
It was like being sniffed by an omnibus. You don't happen to have any of that deliciousness about your person. If you do, it might postpone my need to eat you. There was a wistful look in the bottomless yellow eye that was now glistening next to Stick. The eye was as high as he was. He could only see one. He assumed there was a matching one on the other side of that long snout. Stick was uncomfortably aware that the snout bore a close resemblance to the snout worn by that creature he'd seen on top of the city gate. But he wasn't going to say the name of that mythical beast out loud just yet, because that was a fiction, and Stick preferred facts. No, I ain't got no sausages, he replied, and then wished he hadn't, because it would only encourage this figment of his imagination, of his indigestion, rather, to keep talking to him. Shame. A long sigh, which was in danger of igniting Stick's kecks again. Then, I had a sausage once. It rolled right down a grate and into my mouth. So good! What the bejeepers do they put in them? Blame me if I knows. Stick had to admit this was now a conversation. Nobody knows. That's why they call them bags of mystery. Penny puzzlers. Because there's probably put stuff full of bow wow mutton. <sighs> a long, warm sigh of disappointment. I don't remember when I had last had a nice snack. Stick didn't like the way those powerful jaws snapped shut on the word snack. And he hesitated to raise the subject. But it was, after all, what had brought him down here. When you says you ain't eaten for a while, he began delicately. He hesitated again and went on. There weren't two puny little wayfaced way lads what might have dropped down here yesterday. What you might have snacked on and forgotten about. They goes by the name of Spud and Sparrow, he went on. But maybe they didn't have time for introductions. Not much meat on them, I know. But I was fond of them, as it happens. Not that I recollect a pause, and it added as if it was reminding itself. In any case, I don't eat children. The pupil of the eye next to him narrowed to examine him more closely. But I'm not sure you would count. Far too big for a child, I think. They always says as I was too tall for my age, Stick said quickly. The beast half closed the eye. I'm getting a little peckish here, I must say. It was looking decidedly shifty. I haven't eaten a soul for an absolute age. It yawned, its top jaw stretching to the tunnel roof. It was then that Stuck Stick noticed that the bedraggled remains of what looked suspiciously like the stripy Punch and Judy puppet show was snuggled around one of its very sharp teeth. What happened to Punch and his missus and the cove what does the puppet show? Stuck Stick thought of asking, but he decided it wasn't wise. He reckoned it was best not to ask too many questions about the missing puppets and their puppet master, but it did leave him with a strong feeling that this beast wasn't to be trusted. And he noticed that its mouth was rather closer to him now than it had been at the start of the conversation. Look, Mr, Mrs, whatever, would you mind backing off a little? It's a bit, a little odiferous, it suggested. Stick looked blank. You think my breath smells? Stick shrugged. He hadn't liked to mention it, but there was a definite hint of bag bad eggs underlying the smell of burnt trousers. The snout withdrew with a snort so offended it was in danger of singeing Stick's eyebrows. Unforgivably rude. The boy has the manager's man manners of a hedgefish and not to recognise a lady when he sees one. Big pardon, ma'am. Unlike Spud, Stick was well accustomed to buttering at toffs and it seemed like a good idea not to cause offence to a creature that was as touchy as a lucifer match. I can't see you in all your glory down here in the dark. I bet you're a real sight for sore eyes if I could only cop a proper look at you. It was a shameless bit of flummery, but it seemed to work. Ah, oh, another sigh, more wistful even than the sausage sigh. How right you are, child, if only I could show you. But there isn't room to swing a cow down here. The eye next to Stick suddenly brimmed over. If only you could have seen how magnificent I was in my prime, swooping across the earth beside my sisters, quartering the globe between sunrise and sunset, striking fear into mortal hearts. So how'd you end up in a hole? The eye dried up and glared at Stick, 
I got stuck. Stuck underground. Stuck? Yes, stuck, boy. It happens even to the best of us. Slick had completely forgotten that he didn't believe in this creature now. It was like listening to one of Fly's tallest tales. He wanted to hear how it ended. What Stick didn't realise was how much there was still to come and how it would become his story too. Go on, Mrs. I mean, ma'am, he urged. What happened? I fell asleep after a large meal. The words were slow and reluctant now, almost, you might say, embarrassed. I ate too much. Everyone deserves a blowout now and then, Stick said encouragingly. But while I was asleep, the ground shifted and the earth fell in. When I woke, the mouth of the cave was blocked and my sisters were buried somewhere deep amongst the rocks. I could hear them calling to me, but gradually their cries faded away. I never saw them again. Great rivulets of tears spilled out over stick and hissed and steamed gently, leaving salt-crusted stains on the hot ground. I have been left under the earth ever since, waiting for a knight in shining armour to come and end it all. A quick turn of the snout suddenly almost knocks Stick off his feet. Your name isn't George, is it? St George, that is. Both eyes were blazing down on him now, and he thought he could see flames flickering in the depths of the black pupils. Was there a heart in there, or just burning embers? Stick hesitated. No, ma'am, just Stick, that's all. Plain Stick. There was another name, but it was in the back of that cupboard, along with all the rest of the stuff he didn't want to let himself remember. There was a sigh that might have been relief or disappointment. Oh, well, never mind. I just thought the long wait might have been over at last. If my memory serves me correctly, it is traditionally only a knight that can talk to a dragon, and only a knight that can slay a dragon, a true knight who is pure of heart. But I admit, you don't look much like a knight, or a saint. Too dirty for one thing. And my togs ain't right either, Mum pointed out Stick, who'd seen one or so, one, two sorts of armour in his time, though he wasn't saying where. I ain't got much in the way of trousers, let alone what's needful for a full-blown knight. No, of course, I see that. Another sigh. She don't half do a lot of sighing. Full of money grubs she is, thought Stick. The blaze in the eyes had begun to fade and the scaly snout sank down to the ground. I am tired. I'm not used to all this idle chatter. A lazy, leathery eyelid slid halfway down the eye next to Stick, but she didn't stop talking. My time has passed. Another sigh. I should have died with my sisters instead of being left alone to cower here under the earth. It is not right. It is not in the nature of a worm to cower. A worm? Stick couldn't see much of the beast he was talking to, but he'd never have put it down as a worm. <sighs> the eyelid flew up with a sharp tut of impatience. Worm is the ancient and honourable name for my kind. What a common fool might call a dragon. It was what Stick had suspected for some time. He was bound up down here with a dragon. A living, breathing, breathing and talking dragon. But for a common fool, who liked things he understood, it was a difficult idea to swallow. I had heard tell us all the dragons were dead, he ventured, tactful as he could. I am the last of my race, yet another sigh. Others fear being condemned to death, but I am condemned to life. Blimey, she's mopey as a wet hen, thought Stick. The cobbles creaked above Stick's head as the dragon's ribs rose and fell. The next sigh was very sleepy and the roar was dim to a whisper. The heart is a muscle over which no living thing has any control, my child. That is the greatest tragedy of life. You cannot make your own heart stop breathing. You can make a heart break, said Stick, who'd seen it done. Fairy tales, came the drowsy mumble. Hark who's talking, retorted Stick. But the mythical beast was snoring.